You are listening to continuing coverage of the trial of Chad Daybell from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Let's go back to the courtroom. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Good morning. We're back on the record on case CR 22-21-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. We've got additional testimony from uh Officer Hart this morning on direct. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping issues. The court has received the juror affirmations. I wanted to confirm, have all 18 jurors returned today? Yes, sir. All right. So we've got all 18 jurors with all their juror affirmations signed uh, since the weekend. Also, I uh, had a brief sidebar with counsel as we started regarding uh, Defendant's Exhibit 6, which has been admitted. And upon further consideration, I think will require some the removal of some commentary in there. I think the parties have all agreed. So as we get to that exhibit, uh, I think it'll need to be either amended or substituted. And we'll work on that issue. But um, we'll try to keep that as clear as we can in the record once that exhibit's being referenced and make sure that the exhibit that is submitted to the jurors or published throughout trial to the jurors uh, conforms with previous rulings on that information in the exhibit. So with uh, those issues in mind, is the state going to be ready to proceed with additional direct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Will the defense be ready to proceed this morning? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll note also the prosecutors are here as well as the defendant and the defense counsel. So... Let's go ahead and have our jurors brought in, please, Mr. Bailiff. All right, please. Here's our president account for you, Honor. All right, thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> okay, we are on the record on case CR 22-21-1623. Uh, this is Monday morning after the weekend break. The court has confirmed that all jurors have returned and are properly seated and present. I'll also note the court received the juror affirmation from all 18 of the jurors. So thank you again for following the court's continuing admonishment and instruction during the breaks. We're ready to continue with direct examination this morning. I'll note the state is here present. Prosecutors uh, Wood and Blake, Mr. Wixom and Miss Beatty, as well as Mr. Pryor here with the defendant, Mr. Daybell. Officer Hart was on direct examination as we broke for the weekend, and I believe the state has additional direct. Is that correct, Ms. Blake? That is correct, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. If you'd go ahead and call your witness, then we'll have him return to the stand. The state will call Agent Hart. All right. Thank you. Uh, Agent Hart, you are still under oath for purposes of your testimony. That oath was uh, given last week. In addition, I'll just inquire over the Weekend or since you were on the stand, have you reviewed any of this trial that's been uh, is available online and has been live streamed? Have you reviewed any of the testimony of the trial? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, with that, then, Miss Blake, you can continue on your direct. Thank you, Your Honor. And I do have a modified slide, a courtesy copy for the court and one for Your Honor as well, or one for the court and one for Your Honor. Defense has already been provided one. And Your Honor, this is part of State's Exhibit 183. May I publish that exhibit? Uh, yes, and just to be clear, the uh, identifier information has been redacted on what's going to be published? Correct, Your Honor. Yes, you may publish. <clears throat> Agent Hart, we were here last Friday, and we had been talking about some texts exchanged regarding Charles' death. Do you recall that? I do. And do you recall talking about uh, the beneficiary in relation to Charles' death? Yes, there had been a series of text messages between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell uh, that uh, indicated Lori Vallow had found out that her husband, Charles Vallow, had changed the beneficiary of his life insurance policy. And the images on this slide, is that what we're seeing here? Well, previously there were text messages uh, and then approximately two weeks, 10 days later, Lori Vallow sent two MMS messages to Chad Daybell on July 28th of 2019. The uh, one on the left is the original uh, life insurance policy that shows Lori Vallow, his spouse, as the beneficiary to receive 100% 
of the proceeds of that policy. And this one over here shows the change in beneficiary to uh, Ella K. Woodcock and the date that that was done. And do you know who Ella K. Woodcock is in relation to Charles Vallow? It's his sister. And do you know who she is in relation to J.J. Vallow? She would be J.J.'s grandmother. And again, these messages were sent to Chad Daybell. By Lori Vallow, correct. And if we go to the next slide, I'm going to pause here and allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, when we look at these messages, we'd talked before, there were additional messages in the iCloud account. Is that correct? There are thousands of text messages in the iClouds, yes. And with these particular messages, were there some preceding messages in relation to these? Uh, chronologically, uh, yes, there were. And when we're looking at these messages, do you know who the Mel is that's being referred to? Yes, that's Melanie Boudreau, Lori Vallow's niece. And what was it about these particular messages that caught your attention? What caught my attention was the conflict that existed between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell as it relates to their relationship. At this point, Charles Vallow has been dead for almost a month. And Lori Vallow wants her and Melanie Boudreau to travel to Rexburg, Idaho to spend time with Chad Daybell. Chad Daybell is, of course, still married to Tammy Daybell. And so that is sustained. So you were um, indicating that Melanie Boudreau and Lori were wanting to go to Rexburg to visit Chad. Correct. And can you read the date on these messages into the record? The date of this uh, text string is August 7th of 2019. And then at the bottom, are there some that carry into the next day? Correct. August 8th of 2019. During this time, do you know if Tammy Daybell was still alive? She was. So in this context, it appears that Lori's telling Melanie, we just had a big fight. Do you know who that's in reference to? That's in reference to Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And at this time, Charles has been dead for not quite a month? Correct. What else about these uh, stood out to you? There's a conflict between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell regarding... Uh, I think there's inadequate foundation at that point. Mr. Pryor, moving forward on your objections, please use the microphone. Go ahead, Ms. Blake. Agent Hart, again, you've talked about you went through thousands of messages in this iCloud account or that there were thousands of messages, correct? Yes. Were there some messages preceding this indicating what Chad's plans were during this time? Yes. And what did those messages indicate? Chad Daybell had a... All right, again, into the microphone, please, Mr. Pryor, or maybe your mic's not on today, but... It's not okay, could we get that checked, please, to make sure the microphone is functioning at defense table? So if I remember, this is six. This is 30. <laughs> Okay. Uh, apologies. Ms. Blake, would you ask another question? I'll uh, defer ruling on that objection. Go ahead. Agent Hart, did you review messages that indicated what Chad's plans were during this time frame? Yes, it's a scheduling conflict. Lori Vallow wanted to visit Chad Daybell. Judge, I'm going to object. It's unresponsive. Your Honor, may I respond? Well, I, I, I'll sustain the objection because the the answer was... What Chad's plan, the question was, what were Chad's plans? And the answer was uh, what Lori Vallow wanted. Um, I think that's outside the scope of the question and the foundation that's been laid. So it's non responsive. You determined that Chad Daybell had different plans during this time? Judge, objection. That's leading. Your Honor, he's already answered that. Overruled. Yes, he had a family vacation planned. So, in reference to the big fight, based on your investigation, were you able to determine what this text thread was about? Yes. And what did you determine the fight to be about? Lori Vallow's trip, which conflicted with Chad Daybell's family vacation. And when we look at those last three messages, did you did anything about those catch your attention? From the content of the iCloud, this was the first big fight they had had. And it appeared that they were uh, at odds with one another and Chad Daybell's comments was that his heart was crushed and he would never stop loving her. And if we go to the next slide, again, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, can you indicate the date of these text messages? 
Yes, it's towards the end of the day on August 8th of 2019. Is this a continuation from the conversation we saw on the previous slide? Correct. In looking at this, was there something that stood out to you? Yes. And what was that? If you look at the date and the time, you can see that Lori Vallow has ceased to communicate with Chad Daybell for approximately a day. And this lengthy text, line 1300, is a very clear example of how Chad Daybell used his supposed visionary powers to manipulate Lori Vallow. Judge, I'm going to object. Calls for speculation. Overruled. And in this, there's... Sorry, let me back up. In that first message as well from Chad to Lori, can you read the second sentence of that? Saddest day of my life. And again, you indicated Lori had quit communicating with him after the previous message that we saw. That's correct. So there had been no communication from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell on August 8th of 2019. And after Chad sends that lengthy text... Uh, it appears Lori resumes communication. Is that correct? Yes. And can you read into the record what she said? I love you. And then Chad responds just, Thank you, my love. I will get things restored. So in that lengthy one, he indicated that he may not be able to protect her anymore. Correct. Grandpa Keith is Lori's deceased grandfather. So Chad is Chad Daybell is indicating to Lori Vallow that he is unable to protect her and that the angels are angry that she is ignoring him. And so he is trying to uh, get her to respond due to those indication of what's happening spiritually. And then once she does respond, Chad will get things restored. That's what he indicates, yes. Then if we move to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And will you indicate the date this message was sent? This is August 10th of 2019. And what about this particular message stood out to you? Well, I think this is an example of how Lori Vallow manipulates Chad Daybell. And this image was sent along with the surprises or waiting text. Is that correct? That's correct. And again, on August 10th, is Tammy Daybell still alive? Yes. Moving to the next slide, and again, I'll pause to allow the jurors to read. And if you could read into the record the date these messages were sent. These are August 10th of 2019. So these would have been sent after that image that we saw in the previous slide? Correct. What, if anything, about these caught your attention? There had been several messages preceding these two messages uh, indicating their ability to connect spiritually, to enter into portals, to be together outside the physical realm. What stood out to me about these two messages is that both Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell understand that's not real and it's not true. Lori Vallow says, I wish you were really here to experience this with me. And again, saying, I wish I could wake up and kiss your sweet, tender lips for real. So to me, that indicated an understanding between being together truly in the physical realm in which we live versus this alleged ability to portal and be with one another spiritually. And if we go to the next slide, again, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. Can you indicate the date these messages were sent into the record? Yes, this is August 11th of 2019. And what about these particular messages caught your attention? These four messages are the beginning of a text string that occupies this slide and the next five slides. And it's a lengthy back and forth between Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow uh, regarding um, a, a vacation that Chad Daybell is going on with his wife, Tammy Daybell, and other relatives. And in relation to that trip, can you read the last sentence of that first text? Partly why I am so sad is my trip, is my Boise trip has turned into a trip with extended family. Not happy about it. And then if we move down to that third message, was there something about that that caught your attention? Well, these are Chad Daybell's own words. He says, I can't take much more. So trapped. So it's an indication of how he's feeling as it relates to his current 
situation as it existed on August 11th of 2019. We move to the next slide and I'll pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, you indicated this is a continuation from the previous slide. Is that correct? Yes. What about these messages caught your attention? First of all, the date caught my attention. This is uh, one month to the day after Charles Vallow had been killed and approximately 10 months into the relationship between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Subsequent to Charles Vallow's death, the pressure being put by Lori Vallow on Chad Daybell for them to be together increased significantly. And so you see in these messages that Lori Vallow is asking, is that what he wants for me to sit around waiting for you endlessly and you miserably wasting time? It doesn't feel right. And so these messages are a good indication of their thoughts as it relates to their ability to be together in the current circumstances that they find on that date. And in that first message, Chad refers to it as torture. Referring to the two days he's going to spend with his family as torture, yes. And you indicated Charles Vallow's been dead for about a month, correct? Exactly one month. But Tammy's still alive. Yes, she is. And moving to the next slide again, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, you indicated this is also a continuation from the previous two slides. Is that correct? Yes, it is. When you look at these particular messages, what stood out to you? Again, it's a clear communication between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell regarding the status of their relationship and Lori Vallow's desire to uh, be together overtly with Chad Daybell. And when we look at the last message, the response from Chad to Lori, can you read that into the record? Yes. Oh, honey, that is so crushing. I feel so destroyed inside. You know my love for you is deep and real. I want change. I'm constantly begging for change. I want you. Nothing else matters. But I am hindering your life and you deserve better. I love you so intensely. And at this point in time, again, Charles died one month ago, correct? Yes. But Tammy's still alive. Yes. And moving to the next slide again, I'll pause to allow the jurors to read. Agent Hart, on that previous slide, we'd seen that Chad was begging for change so he could be with Lori. Is that correct? Yes. What would need to change so he and Lori could be together? Judge, objection calls for speculation. The stain. Agent Hart, when we look at this slide, is it a continuation from the last several slides? Yes. And it's still on August 11th of 2019? That's correct. What about these messages stood out to you? This demonstrates Lori Vallow's impatience for this plan that I've testified to previously about the life they want to live, where they want to live it, and their plans to be together and and conduct missions together. And so Lori wants that to happen. And uh, that can't happen while Tammy Daybell is still married to Chad Vallow, or excuse me, to Chad Daybell. And again, to remind the jurors in this, in these messages, did you ever see any indication that Chad was intending to divorce Tammy? Never. Did you ever see any indication that Chad was intending to separate from Tammy? No. If we go to the next slide, again, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read it. And again, Agent Hart, this is a continuation from the previous slides. Is that correct? It is. What about these particular messages stood out to you? Previously, on August 8th of 2019, when this conflict about Chad Daybell's family vacation came up, we saw the text message about Grandpa Keith and that the angels were angry that Lori Vallow was ignoring Chad Daybell. The middle line of this text is a reference to that exchange that occurred three days previously where Lori Vallow is now asking Chad Daybell, are you going to threaten me that I'm unprotected for putting Chad Daybell aside? And his response is absolutely not. I'm so upset at the circumstances. I'm demanding they protect you more than ever. So this was a tie back to the August 8th conversation 
with Chad Daybell. And again, an indication that Chad Daybell can provide some form of protection. Correct. And moving to the next slide, I'm going to pause to allow the jurors to read. And Agent Hart, is this also a continuation from the previous slides? Correct. This is the final slide for this text string. And with this one, if we break it down a little bit, looking um, specifically at that second text from Chad to Lori, are, is, are there certain things in that text that stood out to you? Absolutely. What were those? The first is, it's mainly the second sentence. We are surrounded by telestial relatives that are simply obstacles. Do you know what the reference telestial relatives would be in relation to? Or actually, let me back up. Through your investigation, did you learn or determine what telestial relatives would be referencing? Yes. What did you learn that to be? The word telestial derives from the LDS faith. It is the lowest level or, or degree of, of glory or heaven. Uh, and, and then there are levels above that. So it's a reference to the, the lowest level of heaven as it's perceived. And the specific word next to that is relatives. Yes. And these celestial relatives are being described as simply obstacles. Correct. And then what did Chad say regarding that? What's that next sentence, if you could read it into the record? I'm so sick of it, exclamation point. And there's a response from Lori, but then looking down to the last message from Chad back to Lori, Anything about that one that stood out to you? There's a couple of things that stood out uh, in, in that last sentence, yes. And could we go through those one by one? Yes. What is the first one? Chad Daybell states very clearly what his greatest desire is. I, I want to be with you. That is my greatest hope and dream. And again, during this time, Tammy Daybell's still alive? She is. What else about this message stood out to you? The last sentence is... Telling, in my mind, I would happily join you tomorrow if it felt like heaven would not strike us down. Your Honor, I have no additional questions at this time. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Counsel, in reference to uh, cross-examination and potential exhibit, I wanted to update counsel on that outside the presence of the jurors. So let's take a brief sidebar at this moment. All right. We're back on the record after a sidebar with counsel. Um it's a little earlier than we would normally do this, but what we're going to do is take our mid-morning break at this time in order to get some exhibits properly before the jury, before cross-examination, which will take a few moments. So we'll use that time to allow the jurors to take a break. I'll go on the record with counsel uh, before we bring the jurors back in at the end of the break to uh, make any other additional evidentiary rulings that would occur outside the presence of the jurors. And then once we've concluded that, we should have the morning set up for continued cross-examination and evidence until we get to lunch. So with that in mind, let's take our mid-morning break at this time. All right. All right, counsel, just let me know when you want to conclude the break when we have these exhibits ready. All right, folks, go ahead and head out now. Keep your eyes Thank you. Please be seated. All right. We're back on the record uh, without the jurors present at this time. Take up the matter of some exhibits. The issue being that uh, one of the exhibits needed a redaction and other exhibits had some uh, editorial type commentary on them that the court ruled would not be permitted as part of the exhibits. So those were also uh altered. And so let's just start with the state's exhibit 183. That was on Friday. And it was noted when we stopped for the day that there was some personal identifier information that needed to be redacted. That was redacted and the information uh, was not published to the jury. But in terms of marking or tracking the redacted exhibit, what does the state suggest in terms of uh, a new replacement exhibit or just noting on the record a redaction on the admitted exhibit? Thank you, Your Honor. The state would request that we just note that 
the redaction was made. The state actually never ended up submitting the original 183 because that was caught prior to us finishing with that PowerPoint presentation. So I talked to Madam Clerk and let her know that we were going to go ahead and get it modified. So the exhibit that's actually been entered into the record is the 183 with the redaction. So I think if we could just make a clear record that it's been admitted with the redaction versus the 183 that was previously admitted that wouldn't have had the redaction, if that makes sense, that may be the easiest way to do it. And the jump drive submitted to the court does have that correction. Okay. Uh, from the defense, any objection to handling the exhibit that no, way? No, Judge. And the state and the state provided me all of the redactions, so that's acceptable. Okay, so I'll put that on the record then. Exhibit 183 now admitted and what was published and what will be provided to the jurors has the redacted personal identifier information from those screenshots on insurance applications or forms. So that will resolve 183. On Exhibit 6, uh, that was previously admitted and the commentary, which was not part of the content of the exhibit other than labeling of certain parts of the exhibit has been removed from those exhibits. Uh, I guess I'm looking for how the parties wish to handle that exhibit six, and it's also going to be exhibit seven also, defense exhibit six and seven. Uh, do we want to uh, strike from the record those already admitted exhibits and and admit substitute exhibits. Mr. Pryor, what's your suggestion on that? Judge, I've prepared uh, substitute exhibits, so I would move to strike those three, and, and Judge, it's 6, 7, and 32, which are all by stipulation. Um, I've prepared substitute exhibits. I've had the state, given the state the opportunity to review those in their entirety. So I have 6, 7, and 32, so I would move to strike 6 and 7. I'll substitute 6 and, and 7 in with the um, an additional one and then move for 32 as well. I think 32 we're looking at our records. I don't know that that one was yet admitted. I don't think so, Judge, I, but I may, be, I may have referenced it, but I don't think I admitted it at this point. Okay. Well, if 32 is not yet admitted, then we don't have an issue there. What will be admitted will have the proper uh, labeling. On 6 and 7, I guess my suggestion is going to be we would strike them and maybe relabel the new submitted ones since exhibits were already admitted and call them 6A and 6B. Is there any obje any objection to us giving them a new designated name or do you think it's more clear to just note the changes on the exhibits after admission? Your Honor, from the state's perspective, I believe that both 6 and 7 have multiple subparts that are labeled within the discs as 6A, 6B and subsequent and I think seven's the same. So because of that, I'm not sure if labeling them 6A and 7A would, I think it may create some confusion for the record. So I don't know if we could simply strike the other ones and just resubmit them as 6 and 7, but okay, we'll, we'll leave it to the court's discretion. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that. So that, that makes more sense to me also then. So just to be clear on the record, 6 and 7 were previously admitted. They were not yet published to the jurors. They were altered in that the descriptive language within those exhibits has been removed. So the contents are the same. The descriptions are not there any longer. So six and seven, as originally submitted, uh, are removed from the record. And these six and seven exhibits will come in now with the uh, proper identifiers and just simply replace what was admitted. So, um, We'll watch for that as things move along, Council. I think there's a few other exhibits that are going to require the same uh, treatment that have maybe not yet been admitted, and my staff attorney will assist in identifying those along the way if Council hasn't. So uh, I think with that, then, we're ready to proceed with those evidentiary issues resolved. Anything further before we move on to cross from the state? Not from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. Judge, just that um, if I could have uh, the original six and seven that were struck and have them returned to me, I would appreciate it, Judge. Okay. If we do have those, we'll get those out of our court records back to defense counsel, and then we will make a diligent effort before deliberations that whatever of these digital files go in for deliberations are only the correct exhibits that were admitted during trial. So with that, uh, we're ready to bring the jurors back in. Let's have them return and we'll commence with the uh, defense cross of the witness.
All right, thank you. Let's just strip out things. Stand up. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, we've returned from our mid-morning break. We've sorted out the evidentiary issues we had on the record outside the jury's presence. Jury's return at this time. Agent Hart remains on the stand, still under oath for testimony. The state concluded direct. So at this time, Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to conduct cross-examination, you can do so. And permission to approach the podium, Judge? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Agent Hart. Good morning. Now, um, would you prefer I refer to you as agent? You're retired FBI agent, is that right? I am retired. That's correct. Which, is it your preference to be called chief deputy or would you prefer agent? Agent's a little less of a mouthful, so that's fine. And then, <laughs> then I'll uh, take your uh, suggestion and refer to you as agent, if that's okay. Um, as part of your um, investigation, you went over uh, thousands of of messages. Would that be fair? Yes. Tens of thousands of messages? Yes. Okay. Significant amount. Correct. And you put together a, 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 a summary of what you thought were, were relevant messages, correct? Yes. Okay. I'd, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, who some of these messages were sent to, who received some of these messages. Uh, obviously, you spoke in great detail uh, about messages from Chad Daybell. Is that right? Correct. And Lori Vallow? Yes. Uh, Melanie Gibb? No, Melanie Boudreaux. Well, did you ever have any that you reviewed from Melanie Gibb? There are messages between Lori Vallow and Melanie Gibb in the iCloud that I have reviewed, yes. Okay, so there were messages that were involved with Melanie Gibb as well, correct? Yes. Okay, did any of these folks use um, other names in, just in speaking with themselves, talking, referring to others? Can you clarify? Do you mean that na so, names nicknames. other than themselves? Nicknames. Lori Vallow use any nicknames? Yes. What nicknames did Lori Vallow use? For others or for herself? For herself and when others responded to her. Uh, she would be called Lolo. She would be called Lily. Um Chad Daybell referred to her as Elena. Um, and then there were numerous nicknames for um, her contacts that, that she had within, within the iCloud. Okay. And then as far as um, Melanie Gibb, do you recall the nickname that uh, Melanie Gibb used? For herself? For herself, yes. I'm sorry. I don't recall that. If I mention the word Phoebe, does that ring a bell? Phoebe rings a bell, but I couldn't say definitively that that's associated with Melanie Gibb. Okay. And if I were to show you a text message that referenced Phoebe to Lori Vallow, uh, would that refresh your recollection? It, it may. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Other nicknames, uh, other people, Alex Cox, did he have any nicknames? Um, Al was the most common one. Okay. Melanie Boudreaux? Mostly Mel. Okay. Anybody else you can think of? Uh, Lori Vallow referred to Chad Daybell frequently as Bubby, B-U-B-B-Y. Okay. Anything else? Uh, not that I would classify as nicknames. There were several occasions where others were assigned names by Chad Daybell, but okay. I wouldn't call those nicknames. Okay. okay. Now, if I could have um, Elmo put up, Madam Clerk. Uh, what are we going to put on the Elmo? I'm, I'm going to ask the officer to go back to um, referencing 183. 183, Judge. All right. Uh, 183 has been admitted. So, and Mr. Pryor's mentioned before, there's a light and Zoom feature on that Elmo for clarity. And there, there's a light there as well somewhere. There's a light switch that gets rid of the shadow. There you go. Thank you. Wouldn't make it without any help, Judge, I promise you. <laughs> so I, I I want to start towards the end of what we talked about. Um, and you talked about your analysis of this particular uh, um, uh, discussion or, or chain of uh, text messages. And this is from the Lori, Lolly Time at iCloud, Lori Vallow, right? Correct. And the, the last line... Um, uh, I want you to read 824 again for me. Of 
course, I want to be with you. That is my greatest hope and dream. I would happily join you tomorrow if it felt like heaven would not strike us down. And and you interpreted this in what way? I don't believe I interpreted it at all during my testimony. I read it into the record on direct. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit curious. Um, I want to be with you. That's Chad responding that he wants to be with Lori Vallow, right? Correct. It's my greatest hope and dream. He wants to have a relationship with her, right? Yes. I, I mean, they've been in, in a 10-month relationship at this point, but I think okay. he wants that relationship to be overtly known to everyone. Okay. And you said a 10-month relationship. So 8 11 of 2019. Um, I go back 10 months, and that puts me right to October 31st, give or take a few days. So is it your is it your testimony? You said 10 months. Is it your testimony that that relationship started immediately on October 31st, the first time they met? Essentially, yes. Okay. So they were in a physical relationship from the first time they met? No, I testified that their physical relationship began, began the second time they met in person, which would have been November 15th through the 17th of 2018. And, and your interpretation of what that physical relationship in two weeks later was what? What type of physical relationship they have two weeks later? Chad Daybell wrote about it in great detail. They were... Um, Kissing, fondling each other, in bed with each other, taking each other's clothes off. Okay. And and that, are you referring to the Jack and the uh, the Elena, the Elena story? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, James and Elena. James and Elena. I'm sorry. Yeah. I said Jack. James and Elena. Excuse me. You're talking about the James and Elena story, right? Correct. And you know what Chad Daybell does for a living, right? I do. He's an author. Yes. He writes books about experiences that people have, whether religious or otherwise, right? Yes. And with every author, there's a little bit of exaggeration or um, artistic creativity whenever you're writing books. Would you agree with me? Uh, if it's nonfiction, I would agree with you. Okay. And you also know that this James and Elena was really a, a book in the making by Chad Daybell about his relationship with Lori Vallow, right? I, I wasn't aware that it's a book in the making, no. Okay. So this was just him taking literary, uh, doing a literary exercise, just writing about his relationship with, uh, with Lori Vallow, not for the purpose of doing anything with it, just writing, a le writing about this and making notes using different names, right? I believe it's a truthful and accurate story. Okay. Okay. A truthful and accurate story that you're putting down in writing um, about a relationship you're having with a woman, right? Yes. With some artistic creativity applied to it, correct? I'll agree. Okay. Now, did you have a, ha did you, as part of your investigation, go back and look at some of uh, Chad Dable's writings? We had someone in the investigative group do that. I've had some limited exposure to Chad Daybell's other writings, but I was not the individual who uh, did an extensive analysis of those. Okay. Are you aware that Chad Daybell made a habit of, of at least vaguely touching on some of his personal experiences when he wrote books? It's my understanding that a couple of his books were about his prior experiences in his right. life. And one of his books was about his, uh, his daughter, Emma. In fact, the, the, the very book Mentions the name Emma in the book, doesn't it, Dot? I couldn't tell you the title of the book, but I believe that's correct. So it wouldn't have been particularly unusual for him, given his past about writing about his past experiences, to put together a book or a novel about an, a, a relationship he was having with uh, Lori Vallow, correct? Correct. I think the James and Elena story is about his relationship with Lori Vallow. And it wouldn't be unusual, like in his other books, to maybe uh, provide some artistic creativity as far as the facts are concerned, right? It would depend on which facts you're talking about. Okay. So what you're saying to me is that uh, if the facts are helpful to the prosecuting attorney, he's not making it up. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative. Move to strike. Sustained.
You don't know which facts are creative in this story that he was writing Lori Vallow, do you? I know that we were able to vet and verify an extensive number of facts from that story. Okay. I couldn't tell you whether the explicit sexual detail is accurate or not, but okay. the other elements are accurate. Okay. So when we go back to this lolly time that's up on the, the board here and, and showing us, um, the last line is, I would happily join you tomorrow if it felt like heaven would not strike us down. You see that line? I do. Okay. Um, and you said you didn't offer any explanation as to what that meant. On direct, I did not. Okay. And that was on August 11th of 2019. That's correct. And it talks about heaven would strike us down it in does. regards to the relationship. Say again. Well, it's in regards to the relationship, because I will happily join you tomorrow if it felt like heaven would not strike us down. That's what that says, isn't it? It does. Okay, so that has nothing to do with murder, does it? I don't know that I could say entirely that it doesn't. Okay. Does it have anything to do with the fact that maybe Mr. Daybell felt he couldn't divorce his wife, Tammy? I don't know whether that's what that's in reference to or not. Could it have anything to do with the possibility that Chad Daybell as this so-called visionary who gets these premonitions, wouldn't leave his wife, Tammy, until his premonition came true that she would pass away. Objection, Your Honor, misstates the evidence or the prior testimony. Overruled. You can answer that, officer. Again, I don't know what was in Chad Daybell's mind as it relates to why heaven would strike him down if he joined Lori Vallow at that point. Okay. Tens of thousands of text messages, right? Yes. Okay. I didn't see, I didn't see in any of these, and if you have them in the other 10,000 that you went through, show me the one that says, hey, this is Chad. Let's kill the kids. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative miss and tries to put evidence, not in fact. Overruled. Facts, not in evidence. Well, it's a uh, it's question on cross. It's overruled. Show me the text. It says, let's kill the kids. Well, that is our humanity, Mr. Pryor. If you want to ask if there's a text, that would be different. Is there a text that says, let's kill the kids? There are several texts that talk in detail about the deaths of those two children. Yes. Oh, well, in detail about the deaths and what happened during their deaths, right? Not let's kill the kids, are there? Wait, wait a minute. What do you mean what happened during their... What happened? What I'm saying is that you there's references to Tylee and JJ throughout text messages, correct? Yes. Okay. But there is not a text message that says, let's kill the kids, is there? There are text messages in those specific words, no, but certainly alluding to and planning for the deaths of Tylee and JJ, yes. Okay. And what in reference to how they're planning to, to kill the kids, why don't you talk to me a little bit about that? What exactly uh, did you come across that says, let's plan on killing the kids? Objection, Your Honor. Misstates the testimony. It's argumentative. Uh, that is sustained. Okay. You just made reference to the fact that there are uh, text messages that talk about the planning of killing these kids, right? Correct. What text messages are you referring to? There are several text messages between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell that refer to a plan to take the children and uh, Chad Daybell's ability as a supposed visionary to uh, understand when that might happen. Okay. Okay. So there's no specific text message that talks about we're going to kill the kids and live happily ever after, is there? I would disagree. Contextually, I think that's the meaning of those texts. Okay. So in other words, you're interpreting those texts how you think they should be understood, right? Well, those texts talk about the deaths, using the word death of Tylee and JJ. It talks okay. about their death percentage, and both Tylee and JJ ended up being murdered. So I, if that's context, then that's the conclusion I draw, yes. Okay, so what you're referring to are the text message where, where a numeric number was assigned to particular children about death percentages, correct? Assigned by Chad Daybell, yes. Right. Now, we talked a little earlier, and, and, and that's why I'm leading into this with you, and you could probably help me a little bit. Um, my recollection is you were talking something about Allie Bloomer, right? Yes, that's the second slide. Okay. Well, it's actually the third slide, isn't it? Oh. Can you go to the third one? You threw me off, right? Uh, it starts on the second slide. 
And then the it continues to the third slide. So you so you talked about the fact that because Chad Daybell put a numeric number on the children, that was the reason they were killed, right? No, I wouldn't state it that way, that that was the reason they were killed. Okay. That supported your theory that they were killed because they were put a, a, a dark number on them, right? I believe the dark number provided the justification for okay. them to carry out those acts. Okay. Okay. So when we go down to line 3000, would you read that one for me? The first two sentences? Yes. Allie Bloomer is 4.1 dark. Her cop husband is three dark. Okay. Now, to your knowledge, are Allie Bloomer and her husband dead? To my knowledge, they are not. Okay. So when you assign a number dark, explain this. I mean, you probably know better than I do. Um, is this something that's part of the LDS faith? Not to my knowledge, no. Is there a reference in the LDS faith to light and dark? Light and dark. Uh, yes, there's reference throughout the Bible and the LDS faith to to light and dark. So if there was previous testimony by someone who suggested that light and dark is not part of the LDS faith, they're either mistaken or they're not being truthful. Would that be fair? I don't think light and dark, as assigned by Chad Daybell, is part that's, of the LDS faith. That's not what I asked you, sir, and I appreciate you, you, you answering that way. What I asked you is that is, it, there is light and dark in the LDS faith, right? Objection, uh, Your Honor, ask and answered. Overruled. Okay, it's overruled. There's a, a light and dark in the LDS faith, right? Yes. Okay, so what we're talking about is that there's a numeric system here. Is that what you're telling me that Mr. Daybell's using? There is a numeric system that Mr. Daybell is using. Okay, and you've never seen this with anybody else ever putting a, a numeric system on light and dark, correct? I have not. Okay, okay. And Allie Bloomer and her cop husband are not dead, right? To your knowledge? To my knowledge, they are not. Okay, so is the... Do you know how this dark numbering system works? Is high good or is low good? Or how does that work on the dark spectrum? From what I've been able to decipher based on my participation in the investigation, uh, the higher the number, the worse it is. Okay. So if you're a one dark, that you're better off being a one dark than you are being a four dark, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Judge, could I have... Um, Exhibits six and seven. Yes, I'll have the bailiff bring those over. And if you could just bear with me while I'm waiting this to, to warm up a little bit, we'll move on and talk about a couple of other topics while I'm... You talked about manipulation, right? From both Chad and Lori. Yes. Now, um, Mr. Pryor, just on the exhibit you've got continually being published there, if you're done with that, would you remove it from being published? There's more to come in the trial of Chad Daybell. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage right here from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast.